When I joined Chainlink, I wanted to do meaningful work. Now, meaningful work to me is building technology that will last the test of time and create better lives for future generations. Technology in the digital age has been moving faster and faster. We've done more progress in a few years than in centuries combined. So, technology moves faster and faster. Its impact on society grows bigger and bigger. But you have to ask, what kind of future are we leaving people? Because this impact is neutral. It can be for good or for bad. Is it creating better lives for future generations? Well, let's try to answer that here. When you look at the last 1,500 years, technology has accelerated the rate of change in societies. Just picture someone going from the 5th century over to the 6th century things would be almost the same. They would see almost no change from one century to another. Now picture someone going from the 20th century over to the 21st. Everything is different. Everything has changed. Technology has changed who we are, what we do on a day-to-day -day basis. And you have to ask, how will the world look in the next 5, 10, forget 20 years, with all the new things coming up right now? Well. A good way to understand the world is to look at money. Money tells us a story about ourselves. It tells us a story about who we are throughout time. Money is a storyteller. When you look at the rise of the gold standard, it coincided with the rise of the British Empire. When you look at the rise of the US dollar, it coincided with the rise of the US as a global power. Money tells us things about our past, our present, and it can help us understand what it has in store for us in the future. What does money say about us today? Well, money tells us a bleak story. Money, right now, when you look at this map of 2022, half of the countries around the world have experienced double-digit inflation. Now, we often think of inflation as numbers, abstract numbers, right? Numbers go up, numbers go down, it's good, it's bad. Behind the screen, that's how we think about it. I think it's good to actually think about it on the impact it has on societies, concrete examples, how it affects real people, average people like you and me. A good way to look at this is to take an example of a recent country that had uh, very high inflation. So Lebanon is one of those. I went to Lebanon recently, actually. That's why I picked the example, because uh, I saw firsthand what happened there. Now, Lebanon had around 4,600% inflation in the last four years. What is 4,600% inflation for people? Not in terms of numbers, but how it affects people's lives, right? Well, let's look at this. First, the government shuts down, meaning banks don't work anymore, meaning the police doesn't work, meaning hospitals don't work. Electricity also doesn't work. For people, the price of commodities, of oil, of food, goes 50x, sometimes 100x. And the people have their money locked in bank accounts. They can't get it out, right? So just picture someone who has their whole life figured out. They have a family. They can provide for their family. They have life savings in their bank account. And then from one day to the next, these life savings are blocked. The price of food is 100 times higher than it was before. They have to sell all their properties to actually provide to themselves or to their family. And the life savings that, has, that they had in the bank, which could have bought them a retirement home, can now buy them one week worth of food supply. Now, these examples are important but because when we start looking at the impact that systems can have on people, concrete impact they have on real people like you and me, then we start wanting to change things and finding solutions. And the first way to find solutions is to look at the problem. The problem in the case of Lebanon was very simple. They had systems, in this case the currency, which were non-verifiable systems, where a few controlled the system and they had zero accountability around their actions. So, the way the currency was supposed to work is it was pegged to the dollar. For every 1,500 Lebanese lira you had, you had one dollar which was supposed to peg it, to back it. The way it actually worked is you had to trust that the system worked. 
you couldn't verify it. You just had to trust the people who were in charge of it. And what happened? Well, these people basically put their short-term interest in front of the interest of the many. They moved the money around, which was supposed to back the currency, and when people found out, the currency collapsed. That's not a one-off in history. This type of issue happens throughout history, throughout mankind, all over the world. It's a pattern. It's a non-verifiable dynamic. Using systems where you have to trust a few who control the whole system, and you can't verify their actions, that's a common thing throughout history. It's actually a common thing throughout our industry. FTX, Celsius, Mongox, it's all the same stuff. So imagine, I have 100 examples for our industry. Imagine the amount of examples we have throughout history, among countries, among com companies. It's never-ending. It's a never-ending cycle. And people, instead of focusing on the folks who do that, you should focus on them, right? But you should also focus on the systems that enable them. The real cause here is that people give huge amounts of power to a few who have non-verifiable systems that make them unaccountable for any of their actions. And this type of paradigm destroys countries, societies, civilizations, and it set back our industry a few years when they happen. So how do we deal with this? Well, we're very lucky. For the first time in history, we have a way to deal with this trust issue, with this mistrust issue, blockchain. Blockchain is enforced verifiability. Blockchain ensures that whenever someone relies on a system, they know the rules of the game. There is no surprise. They don't have to trust blindly the few people who control the system. Those people don't exist. Everyone is on the same level playing field. That's what blockchain gives you. When you're using DeFi, congratulations, you're using the first system in history which allows you to enter a financial transaction with one person to another without any third parties that can steal all your money. When you're sending a crypto transaction from one place to another, again, congratulations, you're the first people in history who can transact from one place to another without any third party who can take your money and who can basically make you lose everything. That is a privilege, that is an opportunity, and that's how we should look at blockchain. Blockchain flips the non-verifiability paradigm on, on its head. Forget about misalignment, now we align people because everyone is on the same level playing field. Forget about mistrust, now we can trust each other because we know the rules that we enter when we, whenever we enter a financial transaction on chain. Everyone is accountable with blockchain. This type of paradigm is a ch game changer for us. It's a game changer in history. If you look at DeFi, DeFi didn't grow from a few million dollars up to ten, tens of billions in a few years by magic. It grew because everyone was aligned. Everyone was building a system, and everyone had a shared interest to build it. Basically, instead of short-term interest of a few taking over the long-term interest of the many, DeFi and systems that are verifiable ensure that the long-term interest of the many take over the short-term interest of the few. And what this means for us is creating systems, countries, societies, civilizations that last hundreds of years. That's how you leave marble instead of leaving clay to future generations. Now, let's look at how blockchains could have been used to, let's say, tokenize the lira to solve the issue we saw earlier. Here, there would have been three components. A USD of chain reserves, which is backing the token. The Lira chain, where you actually mint the Lira tokens. And the Lira smart contract. Here, it's already much better. The supply is fully verifiable to all. There is no opacity around how much is actually being issued, when it's being issued, why it's being issued. You have a fully verifiable system. Everyone is accountable for their actions. Now, let's see how we can do more with this system. We want three functions for our token. We want to ensure issuance. We want to be able to transfer our token from one place to another. And we want to use our token in financial markets, in DeFi. For, three, for these three things, I can do something better, much better than what I had with the previous currency. With issuance, I can ensure, by using the power that smart contracts give us, that the reserves 
will always back the supply. Basically, with my token, I can ensure programmatically that the supply will never go above, above my reserves. With cross-border payments, the way it will work in the blockchain industry is that every country, every bank, will have their own chain in the future. That's probably how it will shape out. And these chains will connect to public chains. And you will need interoperability. So I need a bridging standard. And then for DeFi, DeFi allows us to access from anywhere in the world the opportunity for loans, to issue debt, etc. DeFi is very powerful, but for DeFi, I need verifiable price data. So for these three things, I need something that the blockchain doesn't give me right off the bat. I need reserves to ensure that the reserves are always backing the supply. I need a bridging standard, and I need price data to ensure I have a financial market that can be built on top of my currency, of my token. Chainlink has built all three of these things. When you use Chainlink Proof of Reserves, you have a safe token that cannot be over-minted. When you use CCIP, you have a token that can flow from one chain to another securely and safely. And when you use Chainlink data streams, you can have a financial system built on top of your token. Now, let's look at why we need Proof of Reserve. Proof of Reserve solves a never-existing issue in our systems. The issue of over-minting assets is not new for us. The Roman Empire, during its fall, the money used to be counterfeited. They would add lower value metals to the silver or the gold, which was supposed to back the coin, right? It's not a new issue. Basically, over-minting assets is something that has existed forever. Proof of reserves is a way to solve that. With proof of reserve, the reserves which are supposed to actually back the token are put on chain. And then you can programmatically verify at the smart contract level that whenever a new asset is being minted, a new token is being minted, the supply will be below the reserves. If the supply ever goes above the reserves, then it reverts. That's programmatically enforced through the smart contract. That, throughout history, is a game changer. If we had this hundreds of years ago, even if we had this today, life would be very different for many people. Now, chaining cross-chain, CCIP. In the future, when we go towards a tokenized world, every country will have their chain, every bank will have their chain, companies will have their chains. Basically, you'll have thousands of blockchains. And these blockchains will need to connect to each other. Otherwise, you get a siloed ecosystem. And you'll need secure systems to do it, Otherwise, you have a repeat of what happened with multi-chain. That's how CCIP was built, with security in mind. CCIP ensures that we have segregated risk across every single message transfer from one chain to another. So basically, CCIP segregates the risk by having different Oracle networks to do transactions. And on top of that, we have a risk management network that checks for every single token the, the transaction, that the transaction is safe, is secure, that it's basically not cheating against the rules of the system. So CCIP right now is live in production. And what we predict will happen with CCIP is that we'll be able to have value flow freely from one blockchain to another securely, safely, basically breaking the silos that have existed in the blockchain industry to connect every single chain together. And when you connect chains together, you create a bigger ecosystem. Because now you're not only bridging the existing crypto ecosystem, you're also bridging with the TradFi, with the traditional system. You're bringing more players into the industry. That's the power of CCIP. So let's recap. We have the issuance ensured by proof of reserve. We have CCIP, which ensures that my token that's been issued can flow freely from one blockchain to another. Now, I want to build a global financial system on top of it. Chaining data streams is the requirement to build finance. Today, most of DeFi uses chaining feeds, as many of you know. And chaining feeds have ensured that DeFi could grow from the few millions it was a few years ago to tens of billions today. Chaining data streams allows to take the efficiency of TradFi and give it to DeFi. With chaining data streams, we have millisecond latency data, 
which can allow to have extremely reliable systems execute trade, trades at a very low level of granularity. So GMX, the leading derivative exchange, has integrated chaining data streams today. What we think will happen is that verifiable systems finally have a way to compete with non-verifiable systems in terms of latency through chaining data streams. OK, so we've seen the three functions of our new token. We can issue safe assets that cannot be overminted. We can issue these assets that can then flow from one blockchain to another freely, securely. And then tokenized finance is enabled through Chainlink data streams. What we get here is a shape of a new world, a new system. It's a tokenized world that's taking shape. Now, tokenization a few years ago used to be a dream that a few utopists would have, right? So we were discussing, oh, wouldn't it be great if we could tokenize this, could tokenize that, and then we could send it from one person to another. People were dreaming about it. Chainlink was actually building the tools to make it happen. Right now, you have everything you need to ensure that tokens can grow. Chainlink just makes a tokenized word work. Basically, we went from one tokenization use case a few years ago to one every month to one every few weeks, and now we're seeing one every day. What we think will happen will be one new token will be issued every minute, every second, and that until the word is fully tokenized. Why? Because it just makes a ton of sense. Because we finally have a way to ensure that mistrust between individuals and institutions is not the norm anymore. To ensure that mistrust between countries and other countries is not the norm. To ensure that people can all be using the same verifiable system. That's what blockchain gives us. Blockchain gives us alignment at scale. And when blockchain wins, humanity wins. That's truly the potential of this industry. So now we have our choice. We can either let technology move faster and faster, and its changes on society grow bigger and bigger. And we leave it up to the fortunes of hazard to see what happens in a few years. Or we actually decide to take back control of our future. We ensure that blockchain wins. We ensure that verifiable systems win. And when they win, people start working with each other instead of working against each other. Humanity unites instead of dividing itself, and technology works for us instead of working against us. That's really the potential of blockchain technology. And that's why what we're doing here is truly meaningful work for future generations. Thank you very much.